And straight on, the next item of business is a debate on Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime legislation. This is a debate without motion. I can invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Annabel Ewing to open the debate. Minister, 11 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, uh, tackling hate crime is central to building the Scotland that we all want to see. That is a Scotland free from hatred, prejudice, discrimination and bigotry. A country where trust, respect and understanding underpin the way we live our lives. Sadly, while Scotland is an open and inclusive nation, we are not immune from hateful behaviour and prejudicial attitudes. For it is a sad reality that people in our communities sometimes face discrimination and abuse. I know that everyone across the chamber would condemn the deliberate targeting of our minority communities with hate-filled prejudice and I am sure that we are all agreed on the importance of offering our communities robust protection in law to ensure they have access to justice when they are subjected to such vile and unacceptable behaviour. Whilst legislation in and of itself is not the uh, uh, solution to these issues, it is part of the backbone which runs through our society. Uh, through legislation, we have a set of clear standards for what is and is not acceptable. This ensures that those who do cross the line into criminality can be dealt with through appropriate and proportionate penalties. Being a victim of a crime is a dreadful experience for anyone. However, it is even more insidious to be, victim, uh, to be a victim of a crime because of your race, your religion, your disability, your sexual orientation or your transgender identity, which of course are the current protected characteristics. It is completely and utterly unacceptable for anyone to be motivated to perpetrate a crime to traumatise and frighten people simply for who they are. All communities, including minority and vulnerable communities, must be able to count on the law when they are targeted by hate crime. That is why, presiding officer, in January 2017, I announced to the chamber that I had appointed Lord Brackadale to conduct an independent review of hate crime legislation in Scotland. Uh, members will recognise uh, that Lord Brackadale uh, was appointed as one of the most experienced criminal law judges in Scotland. His remit was to look at the adequacy of hate crime law and what, if any, improvements could be made to the existing suite of legislation to ensure that we have hate crime legislation fit for the 21st century. We needed an independent view uh, from someone with expertise in the application of the law to ensure that any proposals uh, emanating from that review would be workable. On 31st May of this year, Lord Brackadale published his findings and recommendations. The review has been placed in SPICE and I hope by now all members will have had an opportunity to have a look at Lord Brackadale's uh, report and his recommendations. And I would like at this stage, presiding officer, to put on record my thanks to Lord Brackadale for his comprehensive report into the very substantive body of hate crime legislation which exists in Scotland. And I would also like to extend my thanks to the, his advisory team uh, that worked with him to support the development of his conclusions and recommendations. As part of his review, Lord Brackadale ran uh, uh, an extensive stakeholder engagement programme which included a number of community events. He also met with many interested parties. Uh, he also met with those responsible for applying the law, including Police Scotland, the Crown of, uh, Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and he also met with sheriffs. Uh, and of course, uh, Lord Brackadale also met with uh, some members of this chamber to discuss his review. This engagement and consultation helped to inf influence the conclusions and recommendations made by Lord Brackadale in his final report. Uh, and I would like to thank all of those who took the time to participate in Lord Brackadale's engagement and consultation by attending an event or by submitting comments. Lord Brackadale's review provides a robust set of recommendations that we will now consider in full. We have accepted the basic proposal that a consolidated hate crime statute would be beneficial and that such an approach has the potential to resolve some of the issues arising from Scottish hate crime legislation having developed uh, in what can be termed a piecemeal fashion over a period of time. Lord Brackadale consulted widely on key issues relating to the operation of hate crime law to develop his recommendations, and it is only right that a full consultation process on these is undertaken. We will now therefore use the recommendations, uh, recommendations as a basis for wider uh, engagement and discussion with a view to proceeding uh, with a consultation uh, in due course. We recognise at the outset that many organisations will have uh, particular views on the recommendations and the final content of what a consolidated statute should look like. So, as I say, I am very keen uh, to engage widely 
uh, and hear people's uh, views uh, on that. The findings from the consultation will be used to inform the policy detail of what should be included in a new consolidated hate crime bill. Uh, and in addition, uh, the uh, bill would help us with regard to the operation of the law to have the law in the one place, which I think uh, users of the law would find very useful indeed. Uh, Presiding officer, it is our intention to report back to Parliament in the autumn, setting out how uh, specifically we intend to move forward with the development of that bill. While today we are discussing how we can make improvements to existing hate crime legislation, it is important to, to note that Lord Brackadale found that our hate crime laws uh, in general uh, were in good order. Uh, and there are some points uh, to note here. Uh, as I have already uh, referred to, the development of hate crime legislation has been uh, rather piecemeal over the years, and we have to look to many uh, different statutes to find uh, out what it is. Uh, and that makes it less uh, user-friendly, uh, and therefore, as I say, consolidation is something that we very much do uh, support. Uh, that view was supported also uh, by uh, many who responded to Lord Brackadale, who felt that it would indeed bring clarity, transparency and consistency of approach to the law. Uh, so, for example, this could bring together all of the statutory aggravations and provisions relating to incitement and stirring up of hatred currently covered by Part 3 of the Public Order Act 1986, Section 96 of the Crime and Disorder Act 1998, Section 74 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003, and the Offences Aggravation by Prejudice Scotland Act 2009, as well as any new provisions uh, uh, recommended uh, in his review that uh, are subsequently uh, agreed to. But as Lord Brackadil has done in taking forward our consolidation on the introduction of a, a, a single hate crime statute, we uh, will also need to consider wider questions about whether the current legislation is as effective as it could be uh, and what would be the impact of uh, making changes and how we can ensure that communities understand what is and is not acceptable and what protection will be available to them. Presiding officer, we are clear that the law must uphold the rights of others, particularly our most vulnerable citizens, and we will always uh, seek to strike the right balance between protecting the public and freedom of expression. But of course, we must be very clear here, freedom of expression is not an absolute, it is not unfettered, but it must also sit with the right of others not to be subject to prejudicial and hateful uh, behaviour. Lord Brackadale made uh, particular recommendations, including the introduction of new statutory aggravations based on gender and age hostility. He also recommended making hate crime legislation more accessible and easy to understand by updating the actual language used to describe hate crimes. And he proposed the extension of stirring up of hatred offences to cover not just race, which is the only protected characteristic currently covered by a specific statutory stirring up offence to actually cover each of the protected characteristics, including any new protected characteristics that Parliament agrees to. Lord Brackadale also recommended that the exploitation of perceived vulnerabilities should be considered as a specific aggravation in its own right. Similarly, he recommended repealing the offence in Section 50A of the Criminal Law Consolidation Scotland Act 1995 covering racially aggravated harassment uh, and was in favour instead of using the approach adopted elsewhere in his review, that is, a baseline criminal offence with an aggravation reflecting identity hostility and in the instant case, that would mean employing a statutory racial uh, aggravation. We understand that Lord Brackadale's recommendations will generate a lot of debate uh, and we understand that not everybody will agree on all aspects, but we do wish uh, to uh, have as wide an engagement as possible and this debate this afternoon affords the initial opportunity to hear members of this parliament's initial uh, views on how they feel uh, the best way forward uh, should be uh, pursued. But of course, I, I do stress, presiding officer, that we genuinely want to engage in this debate and we do want to listen to hear what uh, people have to say, including uh, a, a number of stakeholders, some of whom have expressed a bit of disappointment with uh, some of the recommendations or lack of that uh, were not in Lord Brackadale's report, and we do wish to engage, obviously, with them as well. Uh, by encouraging people to have this mature discussion, uh, we hope that that will result in uh, a hate crime statute that really is world leading and will ensure uh, that we do everything we can to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Because hate crime has uh, a damaging effect not just on the victims, but indeed on the communities that people belong to and that they live in. 
and I believe that hate crime undermines society as a whole because it makes people fear each other and it creates barriers between communities. Uh, and it is therefore a problem for all of society and a problem that we all need to play a part in resolving. Uh, for we know also that inclusive and cohesive communities that embrace diversity do provide a better quality of life for everyone. Communities thrive when they feel a shared sense of belonging, when they learn and grow together and when they feel able to live their lives in peace. So we must challenge the behaviour of those who are abusive and we must ensure that those who have been abused are offering uh, support. And that is what uh, our endeavours should lead to in terms of this uh, uh, work that we will now proceed with as regards a consolidated hate crime uh, statute. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, as a government we have worked tirelessly to promote equality and tackle discrimination. We have done much good work but there is always uh, much more to do. We can never be complacent and we never will be complacent uh, and we continue to strive across government to ensure that all the work that we do uh, feeds into uh, tackling uh, this insidious uh, uh, element in our society. So uh, I would say that I'm very much looking forward uh, to the debate uh, this afternoon, presiding officer. Uh, this uh, report, I think, rec uh, marks an important stage uh, in this process that we are all uh, engaged on. For whilst, as I said, legislation on its own will not solve hate crime, it is a good substantive law that will certainly be at the heart of our efforts to build a country where everyone, regardless of background, feels valued, respected and at home. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call on Liam Kerr to open the Conservative. Mr Kerr, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to open for the Scottish Conservatives to speak in this debate without motion on Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime legislation. Brackadale's remit was to help ensure we have the right legislative protection in place to tackle hate crime wherever and whenever it happens. And it was right to do so. There were nearly 6,000 hate crime charges in Scotland last year, roughly two-thirds of which were racial. And those are just the ones that were reported. It is widely accepted that the real level of hate crime is far higher than is reported in official statistics, as a significant number go unreported. Intolerance, bigotry, racism and prejudice of any kind should not be accepted anywhere in a civilised society. And we must do all we can to challenge it. Lord Brackadale has produced a considerable document which will form the basis for a wide and useful discussion and debate long after today's session. But he makes 22 recommendations, many of which the Scottish Conservatives are pleased to endorse, as will be detailed by my colleagues throughout the afternoon. Starting from the back, recommendation 20 says simply, all Scottish hate crime legislation should be consolidated. Absolutely. As the Minister correctly identified, currently there are many crimes that currently fall into the category hate crime. There are some overlaps, there are some gaps. Now I do hear the concern about the danger of an unwieldy or oversimplified approach or the losing of focus, but I do accept the argument made by Lord Brackadale in paragraph 9.9 .9, that this is unlikely to be the case. And from my own experience, look to other consolidating acts such as the Employment Rights Act or the Equality Act for support with that position. I'm also reassured I'm by sorry, Mr. Kers. Somebody's phone is ringing and they shouldn't have their phone on in the chamber, either in the public area or in the, in, amongst the chamber members. Sorry, on you go, Mr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there is a related point on that, which merits further discussion, which is how to approach recommendation two, the updating of language. Simplification and accessibility is always to be encouraged, but as Gordon Lindhurst will say later, we have to be careful with things like malice and ill will, for example, may not be an identical term to hostility. And we need to make sure we're very careful on these points. Annie Wells will review recommendations nine and 10 that age and gender hostility should become recognized categories of hate crime. We are eager to look closely at any proposals the Scottish Government chooses to bring forward. This is a really important area and we have to get it right. And that necessitates open, honest and frank discourse. Annie Wells will talk about the importance of public awareness and understanding and striking a balance between tackling hate crime at its root without diluting the goals of hate crime legislation, recognising the profound harm it causes, but standing up for communities. In relation to age, although it covers disabilities too, recommendation 11 suggests the Scottish Government consider the introduction out with the hate crime scheme of a general aggravation covering exploitation and vulnerability. Inclusion Scotland particularly welcomes this, and I find their reasoning persuasive. 
As action on elder abuse have said, in relation to crimes such as theft, fraud, assault, older people are often specifically targeted due to their actual or perceived vulnerability. This might be based on physical frailty, mental capacity, memory difficulties, loneliness and isolation, or dependency on others for basic care needs. And as Lord Brackadale's report says, a proportion of offences committed against disabled persons are based not on hostility, but on perceived vulnerability. We can send a message that we will not tolerate those who target the most vulnerable in our society. Criminals must know that they will be additionally punished with a tougher sentence for such callous and inhuman behaviour. And I call on the Minister to waste no time bringing forward proposals to implement this recommendation. If she does, she will have our full support. We were also pleased to note that the report recognises the role that restorative justice can play in dealing with hate crime. As members will know from the members' debate that I called just two weeks ago, restorative justice is, in essence, voluntary, facilitated, constructive dialogue between a victim and offender that seeks to make amends. Restorative justice puts victims first and allows them to be part of putting things right after a crime has been committed. I particularly commend to Parliament the example Brackadale cites at paragraph 10.42 in an anti-Semitism case where the family affected wanted the offender to study the effects of the Holocaust as part of his community sentence. The offender later reflected, I had no idea that being anti-Semitic had this kind of impact. I had no idea that all these people died during the Second World War. As researcher and social work practitioner Rani Ahmad notes, developing an understanding of the harms caused by hate crime is viewed as an important facet of any rehabilitative intervention with hate crime offenders. Many offenders are potentially not fully aware of the harm caused by their actions at the time of committing the offence. As such, a restorative justice approach may be well placed to address the harms of hate crime. There is a compelling case for use, use, utilising restorative justice in relation to hate crime, and I commend Recommendation 22 to the Chamber. Finally, and I shan't major on this point, as I suspect others may wish to do so, the report devotes a whole section to the impact of the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. In what can only be described as a humiliation for some here, Brackadale clearly states there is no need for a replacement of the hated Football Act. We were told repeatedly in this chamber that there would be a gap in the law. The Minister was adamant during the Stage 3 debate that, yes, of course I would. Minister? Yeah, I just would like to point the member to page 63, paragraph 5.30 of Lord Brackadale's report where he says, and I quote directly, the repeal of section six of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act has left a gap in the law. Mr. Kerr. I thank the Minister for the intervention and we acknowledged that at the time, that section six, in committee, we talked very clearly about section six. The Minister said quite clearly in the debate over and over again that there would be a gap in the law in relation to the first sections of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. No, I won't, I'm afraid. That's, uh, that's the third intervention from the SNP benches given the phone earlier. So the reality is the Minister was adamant during the Stage 3 debate there would be a gap in the legislation. And there it is in black and white. Hate crime offences committed in the context of a regulated football match held in Scotland could be prosecuted in Scotland under pre-existing criminal law. I am satisfied that there is no gap in the law just as I and so many others pointed out at the time. Now, I think it unlikely that an apology, no matter how merited, will be offered, but a de degree of contrition and reflection on past and future choice of words by some members would perhaps be warranted. <laughs> Presiding officer, hate crime is particularly harmful to victims and communities. As Rania Hamad has said, research indicates that the emotional and psychological trauma caused by hate crime is heightened compared with other types of crime due to the offending often being related to the core of a person's identity. And vicarious trauma can be experienced by those who share the same identity characteristics as the victims, such as family or community members. Therefore, it must be countered. The first step to achieving that is to know and understand what we are dealing with. This report does that. I thank Lord Brackadale again for compiling this report. I said at the beginning that we must have legislation that we need to tackle hate crime. We must tackle prejudice at its root, adequately punish and deter offenders and stand up for victims of hate right across Scotland. We may disagree about some of the recommendations in this report, 
But I suspect we can all agree on that. And I look forward to hearing the views of the Chamber throughout this afternoon. Uh, thank you. And I did let you make up your time. And, and technically, a telephone may be an interruption, but it's not an intervention, Mr Kerr. I know you're a man who's very careful with the words you use in here. I now call on Daniel Johnson, please, to open for Labour. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by paying tribute to Lord Brackadale, not just for this excellent report, but the way in which he conducted his inquiries and in compiling it. When I became Labour's spokesperson for justice in this parliament, I was uh, told about how complex and varied a brief this was. So it was somewhat intimidating that one of my very first meetings that I held was with Lord Brackadale as part of his uh, inquiries on this. But can I thank him for what was an excellent and very interesting conversation. It was considered, it was principled, and it was very useful. And, and I think the report very much reflects this considered and holistic approach that he has taken to this very important bit of work. Because these are incredibly important issues. We are discussing those crimes which are driven by hatred towards a victim's identity. However, that does beg a question. Why should we treat crimes differently based on their motivation? One could hold that is the severity of the crime rather than what motivates a crime that should determine the treatment of its perpetrator. But I think this report answers that question uh, very well in three distinct ways. First of all, the harm which hate crime causes. Hate crimes cause profound effects on the victim, but it also harms the community group to which that person belongs. An attack on one is an attack on all. And further, the attack damages society's moral framework as a whole. It can sour community relations and breed tension in otherwise well-integrated, multicultural, multi-identity societies, breaking those social bonds that can have such long-lasting impact well beyond the in individual act. Secondly, hate crime legislation has a symbolic function. We must remember this parliament uh, in this parliament that the power of the law that we pass is not just in its operation but also in the message that it sends nowhere is that more true than in criminal law where that symbolic uh, message is sent firstly to the victim that you will be protected by society to the perpetrator or potential perpetrator that you will be punished severely to victims groups in the community that we stand with you against those attacks and to wider society that prejudice and inequality will not be tolerated. And thirdly, hate crime legislation has practical benefits. If you don't measure something, you simply cannot know if the problem is growing or shrinking over time. So that is how we know that crimes driven by race hate have fallen in recent years, but at over 3,000, those charges are still the most common, representing two thirds as just uh, uh, reflected on by Liam Kerr. So it helps both measure that, but also providing consistency in sentencing when those crimes are heard in court. So turning now to Lord Brackadale's recommendations, Scottish Labour welcomes the positive recommendations to help and improve the hate crime legislation landscape. Most fundamentally, he recommends a consolidation of legislation that has been passed both in the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament uh, for more, over more than 30 years. That is no small undertaking, but I believe that Lord Brackadale makes the argument well that this consolidation will have the advantage of bringing, bringing clarity, transparency and consistency to the law. It will also allow future changes, for example, for new protected identities that can be made more easily in the future, providing flexibility and consistency when we do so. That consolidation is also supplemented by proposals to ensure uh, consistency between the various protected identities, using statutory aggravations as the way of ensuring that hate crimes are punished more severely seems to me to be a sensible and reliable approach to this area of law. The new test we have for hate crime becomes whether an existing offence was motivated by hostility towards someone based on their identity. The hostility by itself would not be a crime, which I believe strikes the balance. However, the recommendation does not uh, include new offences. Uh, sorry, the, however, the recommendation does include new offences uh, regarding stirring up of hatred 
And I think this is important because stirring up hatred towards groups based on their identity, as Lord Brackadale states, is morally wrong. Moreover, it causes harm both to the group and to society as a whole. It is therefore right that this type of offence should not uh, cover just race hate, but hate against other identity groups too. The report also proposes a number of modernisations, most notably around the language for transgender pe uh, people, which uh, now looks very outdated. And the introduction of intersex as a standalone identity, I think, is welcome. Perhaps the most consequential of all are the proposals to introduce new age and gender aggrava aggravations. I think these are to be welcomed, but I do note that there are groups outside of this parliament who have made a compelling case for specific laws to be introduced on misogynistic harassment. So can I just say that I think the case for those is well made, and I think Scottish Labour will look closely at those arguments and will seek that those uh, arguments are robustly debated as uh, the proposals are brought forward by the government um, and to put Lord Brackadale's recommendations into law. To conclude, presiding officer, it will perhaps not surprise uh, colleagues in the parliament uh, that, that, that uh, we, James Kelly will cover aspects of the report which talks about the offensive behavior at Football Act. And I will leave him to cover that in more detail. However, for the government, I do think it is worth reflecting on how to take forward legislation in this area. With all the complexity and nuance in these debates, surely this would have been a better starting point. The starting point we have today with an independent report backed by wide consultation. Any legislation that comes out of this starts from a position of strength and thoughtfulness, which is in marked contrast uh, to the government's knee-jerk, reactive legislation regarding sectarianism with the offensive behaviour at Football Act. And I hope ministers will reflect on that. But finally, I would like to close by welcoming this important report. I think its proposals are sensible and proportionate, but most importantly, I think it uh, initiates an important debate and serves as an invaluable foundation and platform for us to have the debate that we need to have in this place. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call John Finney to over the Greens. And as you've split your time, it's three minutes, Mr Thank Finney. Thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I too welcome the report and indeed I welcome the briefings. And one of these briefings from the Law Society hate, says hate crime can and does affect all of us. So I would very much associate myself with Daniel Johnson's remark there where if we can adopt the approach of an attack on one as an attack on all, um, that will mark out the sort of communities that we want because that's what the, that's what this issue is about and and i, I welcome the, the the comments from the, the the minister about wider consultation with communities and a, a keenness to engage in debate because i think that will be a positive contribution this is a fast moving situation as ever with the dcc livingston today talking about returning from srebrenica and wanting to learn and put into practice some of the experience for police scotland to learn there in the previous ministerial statement, I quoted John Scott QC in a previous report saying that the police should be at the front line defenders of the public's human rights. But of course, the primary purpose of uh, policing is, is prevention. Uh, and uh, this is a response to hate crime. Prevention will be dealt with by education. And that is the key long term to this. And I think it's important to say, too, that we shouldn't be in any way complacent um, that certain aspects are generational matter. Some things have they were always like that and they won't change as the new generation coming on. There's been an unwillingness to challenge and um, some of that unwillingness to challenge has emboldened the far right across Europe and, and messages can spread far and wide with social media as we know that. And an unwillingness to challenge the abuse that's been heaped on women consistently and people of our profession, the abuse that female politician gets, the levels of misogyny are utterly unacceptable. So like others, we are very interested in in gender's proposal and we're keen to see this widely debated. I, I think one of the phrases they used in relation to how they saw things, and I think this would be a good starting point for debate, it perpet perpetrates existing hierarchies of um, a, a definition. So what, what we want is, uh, what Lord Rackadale wants, and that is a clear, consistent and easily understood system. Um, and uh, I also note there's a role for the Scottish Sentencing Council when it comes to the, the, the new guidelines that will be developed. Um, but to talk briefly on recommendation six, which um, uh, we thoroughly agree with, and that it's not necessary to create a statutory aggravation covering hostility to a political uh, entity. Um, th that means that we can criticize the apartheid state of Israel. We can commend boycott, divestment, and uh, sanctions. 
And it does mean that I hope as a result of this, the Scottish Government will look at the negative implications of their adoption of the International Holocaust Memorial Alliance's uh, definition of anti-Semitism, which is seen as, as unhelpful. Um, stirring up the, the characteristics, the, 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 there was mention made of under-reporting, and that clearly is an issue, and we must look at methods of reporting to ensure maximum information is there that we can address that. We welcome the opportunity for consolidation, and we welcome many of the recommendations, but most of all, we look forward to the debate that's going to take place. Thank you very much. Well done, Mr Finney. Uh, Colin Liam MacArthur from the Liberal Democrats. Five minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Deputy Presiding Officer, and like others, can I pay tribute to Lord Brackadale uh, for the invaluable work carried out by him and his small team. I don't think any of us underestimate the uh, complexity as well as the sensitivity of the task he agreed to take on. However, his report and recommendations do, I believe, lay a solid foundation for ensuring uh, that the law in relation to hate crime in all its forms is more coherent, consistent and ultimately effective. I know Lord Brackadale uh, consulted extensively during the course of his review, but as the Minister says, I'm particularly grateful to him for the time he took to meet with me and other spokespeople, uh, both to seek our views, but also to share some of his initial uh, thinking. Of course, Lord Brackadale's report is not the end of the process, rather a means of informing the debate that now must take place about the reform we need to see. That is a debate we are having and will continue to have uh, here in Parliament, but it is also one that must take place within the wider public. This report provides an excellent basis on which to stimulate that debate, to raise public awareness and education about what hate crime is, the effect it can have, and how it, it should be curbed. This will not always be an easy debate. Uh, as the Law Society rightly observed, uh, this is a, quote, highly emotive topic which will evoke vastly differing attitudes. Uh, as much as we all condemn crimes motivated by hatred or prejudice towards aspects of a victim's identity, we will no doubt have different views about how best to tackle it, or indeed how to balance those efforts with, for example, protection of fundamental freedoms, not least uh, freedom of speech. This will be a difficult process. There will be strongly and sincerely held opinions leading to fiercely argued positions. However, I hope we can conduct this debate with respect, more respect, frankly, than was shown at times during the recent repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. And I have to say, the opening speech given by the Minister during the Stage 3 debate on that bill uh, was not her finest hour. It did neither the Minister nor, indeed, the Government any credit. Indeed, by starting with a litany of examples that illustrated perfectly how ineffective the 2012 Act had been, Ms Ewing's speech did the substance of her argument no favours at all either. In light of Lord Brackadale's findings, I wonder if the Minister now regrets the approach she took and the language that she used. I certainly assume she wouldn't accuse Lord Brackadale of being manifestly irresponsible and giving succour to those guilty of engaging in offensive or threatening behaviour, or being an apologist for sectarianism, or of foolishly exposing vulnerable communities to abuse, or of being naive and ignorant of the law. Deputy Presiding Officer, none of us have a monopoly on caring about these issues. None of us condone or anything other than repulsed by crimes motivated by hatred or prejudice wherever they take place. And none of us underestimates the damage such crimes can cause victims. So, so let's conduct this debate in a way that reflects those facts and avoids descending into some of the hyperbolic and malicious uh, misrepresentation that characterised uh, some of the repeal of the Defensive Behaviour at Football Act uh, debate. In the limited time available this afternoon, I want to touch on the issue of consolidation, which lies at the heart of Lord Brackadale's review. I know the case for consolidating hate crime legislation has given rise to anxieties in some quarters, but it does seem to me to be an inherently sensible approach to take. The current body of hate crime legislation is fra fragmented, reflecting, as the Minister rightly acknowledged, the piecemeal way in which it has come into existence. And while there are legitimate reasons for this, often responding to high-profile cases giving rise to a public expectation of action, it is not, in my opinion, helpful in creating a wider understanding about what hate crime is or ensuring we address it in a consistent manner. Of course, the circumstances surrounding each hate crime will be different, requiring a tailored and proportionate response. However, having a baseline offence and a statutory aggravation reflecting hostility to different aspects of an individual's uh, identity, as well as the provisions around stirring up, seems a reasonable way of achieving consistency, while at the same time allowing flexibility to respond appropriately to different types of crime. As I say, I know there are concerns that this might reduce the focus on specific needs of specific uh, uh, protected groups, 
but I think there are other ways of achieving that focus. Moreover, if we shy away from consolidation, there is a risk that we're seen arbitrarily to prioritise some hate crimes over others, which itself cannot be a helpful uh, message to convey. Clearly, the prevalence or seriousness of some hate crimes will determine the amount of attention and resources they attract. However, if the essence of what we are talking about is the right of everyone to be treated equally, whatever their characteristics or identity, then creating a baseline uh, offence seems to make sense. I appreciate, though, that others take a different view and we look forward to engaging in that debate as we go forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, hate crime too often blights uh, our society. Lord Brackadale uh, has given us a sound basis on which to uh, ensure that the laws we have are up to the task and I look forward to engaging in that debate about how we ensure it happens uh, when the Scottish uh, Government come forward with their proposals later in the autumn. Thank you. Thank you. Move to the open debate. Tight five minute speeches. Rona Mackay, followed by Maurice Corrie. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In an ideal world, there should be no need for hate crime legislation. But we all know that this is not an ideal world, and Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime legislation in Scotland is much needed and timely. So why do we need legislation? Because hate crimes cause depression, anger, anxiety and trauma. They may well cause social isolation and fear of public spaces. They wreck lives. They undermine society's moral values, democracy and the right to live in a civilised country. When I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, certain words and attitudes prevailed which would not be tolerated now, and rightly so. Hate crimes are born out of ignorance and prejudice, and there's no place for them in a modern Scotland. Lord Brackadale was tasked with quite a challenge in his remit, whether the current law deals well with hate crime behaviour, whether new statutory aggravations should be created in relation to age and gender, religious statutory aggravation, making hate crime laws simpler by amalgamating them, and identifying gaps in the framework to ensure the law protects human rights and equality. Of course, gathering evidence from people who had experienced hate crime was crucial, and so a huge listening and learning exercise was launched. Presiding officer, the recommendations in the report span a variety of hugely important issues, but I'd like to focus today on hate crimes towards women. Lord Brackadale found that there was widespread support for legislation to deal with online and physical hate crimes towards women and has recommended a statutory aggravator in that regard. He states, crimes motivated by hatred of women are well documented and including this as an offence would be a progressive step in tackling misogyny. Presiding officer, misogynistic hate towards women and girls in the workplace, schools, streets and online have reached epidemic levels. The past year has blown the cover on this with the Me Too and Time's Up campaign. As a member of the Sexual Harassment Working Group in this Parliament, we are working on a zero tolerance approach as the first step in making our workplace abuse free, a place where women can work without being harassed or intimidated. It is incredible that we have to address this in 2018 and it is our generation that must eradicate it for our daughters and granddaughters. Listen to these stats helpfully supplied by Engender Scotland, fantastic organisation promoting equality for both men and women. In the UK, 52% of women have experienced sexual harassment, with one quarter experiencing unwanted touching and one fifth unwanted sexual advances. 29% of girls aged 16 to 18 experienced unwanted sexual touching at school. More than one in 10 girls experienced street harassment before the age of 10. Presiding officer, these figures are shocking and unacceptable at every level. Engendered are calling for a standalone misogynistic hate, hate crime legislation in Scotland as a way of halting this epidemic. They believe that to respond to the epidemic levels of misogynistic hate in Scotland, the gender di dimension must be captured. They argue that Scotland has rightly been lauded for the boldness and ambition of its violence against women strategy equally safe and receive international commendation for the Domestic Abuse Act. They want the same innovation to be applied to tackling misogynistic hate crime. Presiding officer, I understand the benefit of a consolidated hate crime and the, the well-made points uh, that Liam MacArthur has just articulated. But I believe that unless we experience a sea change reversal of misogynistic attitudes towards women and quickly, we should consider going down the road recommended by Engender. There's so much more in this review that I could focus on, but time will not allow. So in conclusion, I welcome this report and the direction it takes us to live in a Scotland that's free from prejudice, bigotry, intolerance and hate. Thank you.
Thank you. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Corrie, please. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, let me firstly begin by joining colleagues in thanking Lord Brackadale for his work in putting together his review on, of hate crime legislation. Hate crimes, whether it be through intolerance, bigotry, racism or prejudice of any kind, cannot be considered acceptable anywhere in a civilised society. It is a black mark on the conscience of the nation that in this day and age it still continues. Hate crime legislation is, of course, always difficult to create effectively because there is a balance which needs to be struck to ensure that we adequately weigh the needs of, for freedom of expression in tackling hate crime, which Lord Brackadale does recognise as being important in his report. He includes in his recommendations that a protection of freedom of expression provision should be included in any new legislation relating to stirring up offences. Also, he ruled out an aggravator of hostility to a political entity on the grounds that the freedom of speech to engage in political protest is vitally important. I do believe that the recommendation is very important. Freedom of speech is one of the things which makes living in this country so special, and it is a value which we need to protect, but at the same time ensure that hate crime legislation in this country is tough. Moving on, Deputy Presiding Officer, to the question of criminal aggravators. In his report, Lord Brackadale recognised that the elderly population are often preyed upon, primarily not because of hatred of their age, but because they are perceived to be an easy target for criminals. It is also the same for those who are disabled. He says that a proportion of offences committed against disabled persons are based not on hostility, but on perceived vulnerability. I believe that the criminal law should recognise that these are particularly horrid and serious offences because they are aimed to take advantage of the most vulnerable in our society and we need to stand up to them and give them greater protection under the law. I believe that there will be wide support among stakeholders and the public as well for the idea of making an aggravator of exploitation of vulnerable groups. In their submission to Lord Brackadale's review, the Coalition of Racial Equality and Rights said, and I quote, that it might be better to create a vulnerability related aggravation separate from the offences motivated by malice and ill will. Action on elder abuse stated that in relation to crimes such as theft, fraud and assault and many more, older people are often specifically targeted due to their actual or perceived vulnerability. This might be based on physical frailty, mental capacity, mental, uh, memory difficulties, loneliness and isolation or dependence on dependency on other people for basic care needs. I hope that the SNP government will take on board these comments and make it a top priority in the coming months. There should be, in my opinion, no delay by the government introducing an aggravator for exploitation of those who are, for example, elderly or disabled. The government should get tough on the criminals who are targeting vulnerable members of our communities. Briefly on the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, I remember taking part in stage three of the debate and hearing from various members of the SNP and government ministers that there, should be gaps, there, would be, there would be gaps in legislation if this poor piece of legislation was repealed. And Annabel Euning said herself, it will leave a gap in legislation which she made numerous times. Of course, during the debate, myself and other colleagues made, the, colleagues made the point it wouldn't. And I'm glad that in his report, Lord Brackadale has agreed with us. I'm sorry, I'm in the last minute. The Minister went on as far as to dismiss the statement of the Law Society of Scotland by saying, I do not think that the author of the Law Society of Scotland paper for stage three got things quite right. The further evidence, this further evidence, the SNP was scaremongering during the, the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour uh, Football Act to cover up for the fact that they created bad legislation which was unnecessary and was unworkable. I wonder if we might hear the, the SNP apologise for that today. And in conclusion, uh, I, as I said at the beginning of my speech, Deputy Presiding Officer, I thank Lord Brackadale for his review and I look forward to hearing from government ministers as to which recommendation for the review they'll be taking forward and do generally ho genuinely hope that it will include recommendation 11 around an aggravator for vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to follow by Anna Sarwar. Mr McGregor, please. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd uh, just like to remind the Chamber again, the PLO, to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. I welcome this report and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Lord Brackadale for carrying out the extensive review of all current hate crime legislation in Scotland. Hate crime is a very real issue in this country and we need the robust legislation to be able to deal with it appropriately. And perhaps to demonstrate that as an example, I'd like to quickly raise the case of a couple in Coatbridge who were recently subjected to a homophobic attack while on a night out celebrating their recent engagement. And I would ask if the Minister, in her summing up, 
can assure me and my constituents who were the victims that crimes like this are dealt with swiftly and severely and I know that they would take great comfort from that. I do feel this review is very timely given the incidents and publicity of crimes recently and of course just yesterday uh, we passed the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill. Uh, this bill stands alongside the Scottish Government's ongoing work to tackle bullying, prejudice and discrimination and provide protections against bigotry and hatred. And I believe we all must continue to send the message that there is absolutely no place for hate crime or any prejudice in our Scotland. The Scottish Government is committed to pro promoting equality and tackling discrimination and that is why we have invested over £202.4 million since 2007. In addition, this report recognises that many parts of the current hate crime legislation work well and should be retained. However, evidence points to a need for change where Lord Brackadale made 22 specific recommendations, as others have said. And one of these recommendations includes the repeal of the current racial harassment law to allow all hate crime legislation to be combined into a single act. And I think that is a good recommendation. The review also recommended there should be new statutory aggravation based on gender and age hostility. Again, this comes at a good time where we see a real shift in cultural change in terms of society and standing up to harassment, abuse and behaviour, which may have been tolerated in the past, uh, as Rona Mackay pointed out, but is no longer acceptable. And I do know that Lord Brackadale did not propose new offences for elder abuse or misogyny, and I'm aware that campaigners have been disappointed by this, but as the Minister said in her opening statements, that she is keen to hear the views across the, state, the Chamber and wider Civic Scotland. The report also found no need to create new laws to deal with hate crime online and no statutory replacement was required for Section 1, as has been mentioned, of the Offensive Behaviour of Football and Threatening Communications Act. Something that I feel OK to say that I agree with on balance and I felt that this was probably the more difficult part of the scrutiny of that bill when I was a member of the Justice Committee. However, Lord Brackadale recommends reintroducing an element of the Act by concluding that the repeal of Section 6 has left a gap in the law when it comes to setting up hatred offences, apart from those relating to race, as this is the only area the law covers. And I'm going to come to your comments, uh, Mr Kerr. Something that I remember through the scrutiny of the offensive behaviour at football, uh, when I was a member, uh, again, when I was a member, that a majority of witnesses agreed with. And I, I was quite surprised by Liam Kerr's early remarks, where he said that the Section 6 um, part of the, the Act, that there could have been a gap of the law, but his party went to vote for repeal of it anyway. And, and it does mean that unlike elsewhere in the UK, Scotland now has no specific offence for stirring up religious hatred. I will take you. Liam Kerr. Very briefly, I thank the member for taking the intervention. The member and his colleagues made some pretty robust and now incorrect comments about us being irresponsible during the repeal of the Football Act. Will he now apologise for that scaremongering and perhaps uh, apologise to us? Fulton uh, McGregor. I, I don't think the member just heard what I said. I, I said that and I, I, made it, I made quite clear in my, in my speeches during uh, stage one and stage three that, that there was issues with the section one. And I think everybody accepted that, but on balance, I felt that it should be kept. But on, on section six, you yourself today have said that there, was, there could have been a gap in the law with that. It was only, I'm, I'm going to have to move on because there's a minute left. It was only a few months ago that members called on the Scottish Government to recognise growing numbers of anti-Catholicism in Scotland, where there are some shocking statistics in terms of disp disproportion uh, of incidents. But, but by taking forward this recommendation, we would see the stirring up of offence connected to religion set out in the Act reintroduced and extended. It's also clear that there's an issue in terms of the underreporting of hate crime, and we can take into consideration that further improvement should be taken by responses by the police, the prosecutors and the courts. And, and this is actually an issue, presiding officer, that, um, that, that we've, I'm the, the convener of the racial equality group, and this is an issue that we pay a lot of attention to in that group, and we've had uh, presentations from the police. It's essential that a continuous process is adopted across government and all criminal justice partners work together to drive up reporting of all hate crimes, give victims more confidence while removing inconsistencies in the recognition and prosecution of different types of crime. Presiding officer, how long have I got left, given the intervention? Got to be fair. This brings me to a recent case uh, involving one of my constituents, presiding officer, who is the man found guilty of a hate crime for filming a dog's Nazi salute. The accused said that this was intended to be a joke. As the constituents MSP, I've had representationists from both sides of the argument who make the case strongly and pass passionately, and actually in many ways reminded me, uh, although, although clearly different You uh, must context, come to a close, Mr McGregor. Um, OK, thanks, President Officer. I'll just finish this point. In a low, a low clearly different context, it reminded me actually of the, the evidence gathered in offensive behaviour at football. Um, sessions 
It split a public opinion into two camps. You must come to one, a close, please, One who Mr. agreed McGregor. with the verdict and one who didn't. And I think this case, to me, highlights the need for a clearly defined hate crime legislation. Thank you, President Officer. Call Anna Sarwar to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Deputy Speaker Officer. And can I start by thanking Lord Brackadale for his uh, report? I think it's a very balanced report and one that should be welcomed by all members right across this chamber. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that he has uh, included both gender and age as uh, aggravations, uh, although there will be some debates to come in terms of what further measures could be taken. I, I wanted to just, in the time that I have, to raise a few um, outstanding issues, I think, that still remain from the report and issues that I think still require further discussion and debate. Um, one of them is the legal framework itself. So uh, while it's right that we have the inquiry that will look at the legal framework, I think a consideration needs to be made about how that legal framework is then used in practice. So what does it mean for individual police officers? What does it mean for the procurator fiscal when it's implementing any legislation? What does it mean for individual lawyers or judges? What does it mean for any potential victims or indeed perpetrators? I think that needs to be looked at much more in the round, because there is a feeling uh, among certain sections of our communities that there are not equal protections in law for people of different communities, different faiths and different backgrounds. And I think if you look closely at the Lord Brackadale review, I think if you look closely at our legislation, I think we do have equal protections in law, but perhaps we don't have equal um, actions in how that law is implemented for different communities. And I think that needs to be looked at in much greater detail. Now, it would be no surprise to uh, people in the chamber that I will uh, raise the issue of Islamophobia. Um, I think there uh, much more work needs to be done around defining Islamophobia. I would have hoped that Lord Brackadale would have considered that as part of his review, but perhaps it was out with um, the remit. Uh, the First Minister did write to me to say that I uh, would be in touch with Lord Brackadale in advance of the publication of the review to discuss the definition of Islamophobia. Unfortunately, that did not um, happen, uh, but I hope to have a, a conversation with Lord Brackadale and his team um, soon to discuss the issues around the definition of Islamophobia. Um, and the reason why I think we need to define Islamophobia is, first of all, we have to recognise that Islamophobia is on the rise uh, and we have to give that recognition to our communities. Um, so I like to think of it in four different key areas about why we need a definition of Islamophobia. Firstly, a failure to define Islamophobia risks allowing those with ill intent to define it for us. Secondly, in the valid debate of freedom of speech, something I'll come back to in a moment, it's important to define Islamophobia so that it cannot be mischaracterized as restricting the, or questioning of theology. We should be allowed to question theology. We should be allowed to question different opinions and different beliefs. But what we should not be allowed to do is hate someone for having a belief. And thirdly, it's important to define Islamophobia so there's a clear reference point for the legal system when considering any hate crime or incitement cases. And fourthly, defining Islamophobia will help to demonstrate to our diverse communities that we as lawmakers recognize that Islamophobia exists, that it impacts on communities, and that we take seriously the fact that we will challenge it. And I just want to point, follow up on um, Fulton McGregor's point about freedom of speech. Um, a lot of people who will look at the hate crime legislation will look at it and think this is an attempt to curb freedom of speech. Um, I believe in the protection of freedom of speech. But what we are talking about is the freedom to offend, the freedom to abuse, and the freedom to hold prejudiced views that impact on individuals' life experiences, life chances, and life outcomes. That cannot be allowed to happen. And that's why we must get the balance right. Part of that is accepting that there will be a hardcore group of individuals who will always claim that any attempt with hate crime legislation is an attempt to curb freedom of speech, no matter what is agreed or how it is applied. So surely the test has to be whether it passes the test with a fair-minded majority. In order to, to do that, any definition must not be an attempt, as I say, to stifle debate or disagree on theology. It must solely be focused on prejudice and bias, focused towards Muslims, the followers of Islam, and those that are misrecognized as Muslims rather than Islam um, itself. And as part of that, there has to be a broad recognition that we still have a problem in our society with everyday sexism, everyday homophobia, everyday racism, everyday anti-Semitism, and everyday Islamophobia. And we also must recognize that we can have the greatest legal framework in the world, but the vast majority of prejudiced views will not be criminal. It's not something you can go to a police officer, it's not something you can report, it's not something you can get a judgment on, 
but it still impacts on people's life chances and life opportunities. It impacts on their employability, their education, there's a gender nature to it, how access to public services, how they feel in their own individual communities. Um, and I, I was hoping to say in a bit more detail around online and social media, but I, I will leave that for now, except to say that social media was meant to open up the world, but in many cases it is helping to spread hate and prejudice. It's creating echo chambers of hate and prejudice. And all of us who believe in creating a society free of hate, free of division, free of abuse, must see the fight against all forms of prejudice as a fight for all of us. Thank you. Call George Adam to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. Can I just say before I start, I appreciate the tone that Anna Sarwar had in the debate, and I think that's what we, the way tone we should have in this debate as we move forward, because I think Lord Brackadale's report gives us that opportunity. And I know we say this all the time, President Officer, but I'm pleased, extremely pleased to be speaking in this debate and discussing Lord Brackadale's report, because any mature democracy needs to be able to look at itself and ask the very difficult questions. And simply put, these questions are, are we a nation that accepts people regardless of their background? Do those from Scotland's very diverse populations and communities feel safe and wanted? And are those with extremist views dealt with when they use their attitudes to offend others? And basically, are our laws robust enough to answer most of these questions I've already asked? These are not all the questions that we can ask, but this is a good start. And it's my view that that is what Lord Brackadale's report is all about. And it, asked to, it was asked to consider our current hate crime laws how well we deal with hate crime behaviour and whether there's a need for a new or further legislation in hate crime. And one of the points that stands out for me is the question, and I know the, the minister mentioned it, is uh, the question of looking at hate crime laws and seeing is there a way to make it them simpler and bringing them all together in one place. Another is the fact that Lord Brackendale said there were gaps in the law. Now, presiding officer, there is no way we could have this debate without mentioning the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act. And my opinion on that legislation are already on the official record. And I do not wish to go through that debate again. So, so today, I will only look at what Lord Brackendale suggested. One of the gaps in the law that myself and colleagues suggested would happen with repeal was Section 6 of the Act, that threatening communications would be a problem. And I am pleased that this report agrees with that opinion. We would end up that we are currently the only part of the United Kingdom that doesn't have legislation in this matter. But that brings me to another part of the report, and one that we must ensure we address. The Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act was there for a specific reason. Presiding officer, that problem has not gone away. The Act may be gone, but the problem is still there. And as I have said, I accept the Scottish Parliament's decision with regards to this, but we must look at ways to ensure our laws on religious intolerance are robust and find a way to deal with this very difficult problem we have in our communities. My reading of Brackadale's recommendations on this uh, is we look to the law that protects our communities from those who wish to stir up religious hatred. Effectively reintroduce, he asked to effectively reintroduce and extend the parts of the previous act against those who stir up religious hate, extending it and taking it away from football. But those are all the things we can debate both here and all over the country as we discuss this matter further in the coming months. But updating, uh, updated hate cr uh, crime legislation must have balanced protections required with human rights, freedom of speech and civil liberties. But part of that balance must be the assuring we protect our communities from hate. The type of future Scotland I want for my children and grandchildren is one free of hate. And in the immortal words of John Lennon, which I blame my mother for this in no way, you may say I'm a believer, but I believe that this is the way forward because there is no place for any hate crime in Scotland. The Scottish Government is clear that any form of hate crime or prejudice is completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated in 21st century Scotland. We must celebrate and embrace Scotland's diversity. Everyone in Scotland must feel empowered, regardless of their race, faith, sexual orientation, gender identity or disability. And disability is one of the ones that we sometimes forget about, obviously, because my own circumstances with Stacey uh, having MS, and it's one that you see day in and day out. And Stacey will quite gladly say to people that as a disabled person, she sometimes feels as though she is invisible at times. So everybody must feel safe and secure within their communities. 
And, President Officer, what we do in this chamber, in our Scottish Parliament, influences uh, the tone for what type of nation we want to be. The Scotland I want, and I know many of us in here want as well, is uh, we want a Scotland uh, that will not be easy to actually... To, what, one we want to create is one that won't be easy to create, is where we have a tolerant society. And we will stumble along that road. We will have difficulties as we move towards that. But when you set off on a journey like this, you have to ensure that the destination is the most important thing. And for me, the Lord Brackadale report gives us that starting point for us all to have the mature discussion and decide what type of Scotland we all want. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Claire Adamson. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too am pleased to have the opportunity to speak today on Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime legislation. With 22 recommendations, there's a lot to cover. So I too will quickly give my thanks to Lord Brackadale and his team for the extensive work that has been carried out. Hate crime of any kind should not be accepted in a civilised society, which is why I look forward to working with the Scottish Government in framing how the recommendations are taken forward. If you look at this review in the context of hate crime in Scotland, we know there is still much more work to be done. And although hate crime overall has fallen in the last year, sexual orientation aggravated crime is up 5% and religiously aggravated charges are up by 14%. And when considering whether current hate crime law represents the most effective approach the justice for the justice system, to deal with crime motivated by prejudice, intolerance and hatred, considerations need to be given to the following. Does current hate crime legislation need to be simplified and rationalised and do new categories of hate crime for characteristics not currently legislated for need to be created? Notably, the report recommends that age and gender should become categories of hate crime rather than standalone offences. These would operate as aggravators to other offences in much the same way for other protected characteristics like religion and race. Of note, Rape Crisis, Scottish Women's Aid and Engender have also stated that they wish to see standalone a standalone offence for misogynistic harassment, stating that adding gender to a, list of la a laundry list of groups may lead to under-reporting. And as Liam Kerr stated in his opening speech, the need for open and frank discourse is important, particularly on these points. Of course, we must do all that we can to tackle hostility motivated by a person's gender or age, but we should remain open to what the potential implications could be. As a party, we would of course consider any legislation that was brought forward by the Scottish Government very carefully. But I do want to ask, in expanding category, categories and creating new offences, do we run the risk of undermining public understanding of the issue? And is there, is there a possibility we may dilute the original goals of recognising crimes against groups such as ethnic minorities and disabled, disabled people? As Lord Brackadale suggests, improved public understanding is required regardless of what proposals are taken forward. There is a need to promote and enhance the public understanding of what hate crime means and is including its role in sentencing, something that may encourage better response from those who become involved or are affected by such crimes to report these matters to the police. Akin to this, the report does suggest, aside from hate crime, the creation of an aggravator for exploitation of vulnerable people, giving courts the ability to increase sentences for offenders who target victims because of their age or disability. The SNP must make it a priority to get tough on criminals who target the vulnerable, and as a party, the Scottish Conservatives wholeheartedly support this recommendation. With regards to hate crime as a whole, the Scottish Conservatives continue to support the existence of hate crime as a special category, recognising the profound harm that hate crime causes to the victim and the community they belong to. As research has shown, the emotional and psychological trauma caused by hate crime is heightened due to the offending being related to the core of one person's identity, something that, of course, has an impact on the entire community. We also agree with the reviewer's recommendation that statutory aggravations should remain as the method of prosecuting hate crime. To conclude today, I would like to stress the importance of Lord Brackadale's work, 
This can help shape how we tackle hate crime as, as a society right across Scotland for years and help educate the younger generation. That being said, I would like to call on the Scottish Government that going forward they tackle hate crime at its root causes. While hate crime has gone down over the last year, we must not get complacent and, and ensure that we see that downward trend continue. With early intervention, hate crime can hopefully become consigned to history. Thank you. Call Claire Adamson to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would also like to put on record my thanks to Lord Brackadale for this report and to all of those who responded to the consultation and contributed towards what is a comprehensive review um, and uh, done under extensive consultation and uh, cooperation with people. Scotland is an inclusive, forward-thinking country and this should be reflected in our law. Although we have seen a downward trend in hate time statistics in Scotland more widely, we mustn't be complacent and it is vital that our law is capable of dealing with the minority of people who continue to perpetrate hate crimes in Scotland. Although we don't know where this is the starting point, as been said by many of um, uh, the members this afternoon, and uh, we may decide to take a different route from the recommendations going forwards, nonetheless we have a starting point and I was pleased to see that the review does recommend new statutory aggravations, including ones for crimes which are motivated from hatred of gender, um, which Rona Mackay talked about early on. In the age of the Me Too movement, we should rightly recognise that many of the crimes which are perpetrated upon women are hate crimes, and this should be recognised in court and taken into account when a sentence is applied. And can I say a little bit about accessibility and transparency? That seems to be a theme that uh, uh, Lord Brackadale is looking for. Uh, it's effectively labelled offences send out a message to society and to those who are found guilty because they lay out the harm done to the victim. And this clarity is simply not provided in common law breach of the peace unless one of the existing aggravation attaches to that offence. And even on occasion where it does, an offence as wide as breach of the peace can be inappropriate in cases of targeted hate crime. The Law Society of Scotland has said that they fully support the development of a hate crime offence. And, presiding officer, there is no place for hate crime in Scotland. Alongside legislation, it is important that we as a society are taking the correct steps in order to stamp out hate crimes. So I'm pleased that the Scottish Government have launched the Talking Prejudice and Building Connected Communities Action Group, convened by the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities, and that we've seen successful initiatives such as the Government's Hate Has No Home in Scotland campaign in partnership with Police Scotland. The Brackadale View also noted an underreporting of hate crime, and many people have spoken about this this afternoon. It describes this as a serious problem, and I agree. This is partly attributed to lack of awareness of what hate crime is, and acceptance that within certain communities, the abuse of conduct was just part of daily life, and people should put up with it. And I have to say, this is shocking, and it is completely unacceptable for 21st century Scotland. We need to address those concerns through clear legislation and education programmes that raise awareness of hate crime and encourage communities to come forward to police and exercise their rights. I'm also pleased that the Action Group are considering underreporting as part of the remit and I look forward to seeing what comes out of the group's work in that area. I want to live in a Scotland that is inclusive and a safe place for all those to choose to make our country their home. We can help keep Scotland inclusive by ensuring that our legislation is up to date, fit for purpose and by educating citizens on what is unacceptable and how they are able to exercise their rights by reaching out to disengaged communities and by all of us standing up and condemning hate wherever we see it in our society. And that's whether this hate is based on gender, race, sexuality, nationality, religion, disability, age, transgender identity because these are the diverse characteristics that make our country so wonderful. The people of Scotland should have confidence in the law and the justice system. And we are an outward looking inclusive society and I look forward to the Scottish Government taking forward these proposals in a manner that reflects that modern Scotland. Thank you, President. 
call James Kelly to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start by thanking Lord Brackendale for uh, the report that, in, and the inquiry that he's carried out. It's a very considerable uh, body of work that's been seriously researched. And I think it's, a, 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 as Daniel Don Johnson said, a fine example of how uh, a platform for legislation should be developed uh, and then taken forward. I think everyone obviously agrees that uh, hate crime is abhorrent and has no place in modern Scotland. And from that point of view, the review is very much needed in order to ensure that our laws are uh, fit for purpose. Um, I know that in terms of some of the issues coming out of it, it will uh, engender a, a fair bit of debate. Uh, I can see the logic, for example, uh, around the consolidation of hate crime legislation into one place in a practical sense that is helpful for prosecutors and also uh, for members of the public. Uh, however, I also recognise the points made by Rona Mackay that there have been some reservations about that. And I think there'll be, uh, I hope, a considered debate about this uh, going forward. I think also, in, the same is, is true in relation to aggravations, uh, whereas uh, I think there's broad support for extending the aggravations to age and gender. Uh, there have been some criticism that it's not gone far enough. However, the report allows us to explore these issues and to move on. I do welcome the conclusion of the report that uh, there's, no new, there's no new legislation required in relation to football-related offences. And indeed, in relation to football, there, is, uh, there was no gap in the law. Uh, I think this reinforces the arguments that were put forward during the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. And uh, I don't think it uh, does the, the government or SNP MSPs uh, any good to their credibility to try and hold on uh, to parts of that act. Uh, I think the reality is that it was discredited uh, during the parliamentary process, not just in parliament, but in the country. I think the issue... Yeah, sure. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. One of the arguments against the Offensive Behaviour Football Act was that symbolism in law was not important. Does he agree now that symbolism is important because Lord Brackadale says that? James Kelly. The most, the most important thing I would say is that uh, law has got to be effective. And the lesson from the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act is that you had a badly drafted piece of legislation and it was an example of a government that was reaching uh, too far. And unfortunately, that reach uh, therefore went all the way out into the state in terms of how the police actually operated. The reality was that football fans were treated uh, like second class citizens. The amount of money uh, that was used in pursuit of people under the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, it, it, much of it uh, was wasteful, you know, because we had instances where uh, wide-scale use of CCTV to film football fans, innocent football fans, got into matches. Then the review of that CCTV and police officers turning up, you know, in some cases mobbed handed at people's doors at six o'clock in the morning uh, to then arrest them. And the reality of that legislation was that it took many people into the criminal justice system for the very, very first time. And many of those cases didn't end up reaching the courts or people were uh, ultimately found uh, not guilty. The final point that I would want to make is around the sectarianism working group that's been set up. I welcome the, the, the setting up of that group because definitions uh, are very important. That was one of the flaws of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. However, I believe there's a real problem for the, the government in terms of the membership of that group. No formal member of the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, has... Uh, yes, you're... No, Mr Kelly's just finishing. Right, sorry. Um, the, there is no... Uh, there is no record... There's no formal membership in terms of the Roman Catholic Church for that group. 
And I think, and I think that uh, you're, you're saying Margaret Lynch, you're saying Margaret Lynch from a sedentary position. With all due respect to Margaret Lynch, she is not an official member of the Roman Catholic Church. But that, but that I mean, um, but that I mean, it must come to close. But that I mean, but that I mean, I, I, I mean a bishop, a priest, or somebody, or somebody appointed, somebody appointed by the church. And I believe that to be a major flaw. And I, I say you this seriously. must come to a close, Mr. Kerr. Sure, I say this seriously to the minister that you really have to address the flaw in that group. Because if you want to take you must come to a close, Mr. Kelly, and you should always you speak must, through the chair. You must Please properly close. Properly involve an official member of the Roman Catholic Church. I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, yeah, I, I won't comment. <laughs> um, Scotland prides itself on our tolerance, our embracing of diversity, something that is at the core of our society and values. And although we're far from perfect in this regard, it's important that we continue to work hard every day to tackle intolerance wherever we find it. And hate crime is a hugely damaging effect on both victims and communities, and everyone has the right to be safe and to feel safe. And that's why this review of hate crime legislation is so important. It allows us to make clear what behaviours are unacceptable. And the work we do in this parliament is much more than just legislating. We're able to influence culture across society, to reinforce existing trends, and to impact on the direction of others. And the review recognises this, stating that the law has the potential to contribute to long-term cultural change and the acceptance of diverse communities. In terms of the characteristics covered and the range of issues it raises, the, rev the review is broad, and much has been said already in this debate on many of those aspects that I won't repeat. In the limited time available, I'd like to focus my remarks on three issues in particular. The first concerns the interaction between definitions of hate crime and political expression, in particular in relation to whether criticism of a political entity should be defined as a hate crime. A hate crime is often concerned with communication, spoken or written, and this forces us to define other boundaries, specifically those separating hate speech from free speech. The review comments on this, recognising that the right to engage in legitimate political protest is fundamental in a democratic society. There is a tension between freedom of expression, which protects legitimate political protest, and conduct which is racially aggravated. In particular, the review considers political protest in this context and makes it clear that it does not consider criticism of a political entity to be a hate crime. In fact, it considers that such an approach would extend the concept of hate crime too far and dilute its impact. It also concludes that it would be open to interpretation and abuse for political ends and open to change over time depending on the political climate. I'm glad that the review comes to this conclusion, making it clear that hate crime legislation should not be used to stifle legitimate political expression. The second issue concerns the position the review takes with regards to differentiating between those of faith and those of no faith with respect to hate crimes. There is evidence that people of no faith, particularly those who have left a faith, face targeted violence solely on the basis of their belief position. The review, however, has concluded that while in principle hostility towards members of a group based on non-theistic beliefs could give rise to a hate crime, it does not believe that such an extension is required. The result of what the review proposes would be that someone who has changed their religion from one faith to another could be a victim of hate crime, but one targeted similarly for leaving a faith to a position of non-belief could not be considered a victim of a hate crime. And I would have preferred the review to have reached a different conclusion and to have offered the same protection to those of no faith as those with faith will enjoy. Finally, I want to note that the blasphemy laws are still on the statute books. These laws, although not having been used for some time, focus on a narrow definition of religion. They also hamper efforts to challenge blasphemy laws which are used in many countries around the world where individuals have faced persecution, imprisonment and even threat of execution by states who still have active blasphemy laws. International efforts to convince those states to rescind such laws have faced challenge because countries, including Scotland, still technically have blasphemy laws. In that context, I feel that taking steps to remove blasphemy laws from the statute books as part of this wider review would be welcome. In conclusion, presiding officer, this review contains much that is to be welcomed. It makes clear that hate crime is no place in the Scotland we want to live in, that we are a diverse and tolerant society, and that the laws we pass in this place reflect those values. Because despite all the work we do here and the pre prevalent attitudes of the vast majority of our citizens, pockets of racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia and other forms of prejudice still exist. And we need to continue to work tirelessly to challenge those attitudes 
to make it clear they have no place in a modern, tolerant Scotland. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your brevity, Mr McKee. That's useful. Uh, can I have Oliver Mundell, please, be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased today's debate is taking place. I think it's been a useful debate so far. And I think the whole chamber is aware of how important it is that we adequately tackle and address hate crime in Scotland. We all want to live in a tolerant society. And for me, uh, it's about remembering that in an ideal world, it wouldn't be necessary to legislate in this area at all. However, we have to recognise the persistent and deeply unpleasant problem that continues to plague our society and makes so many people's lives a misery. The kinds of offences and instances that members have identified this afternoon are not just a problem for the individual victims, but they're problems for all of us. And whatever uh, we think of the recommendations and the differing opinions, there can be no downplaying or dismissing uh, how severely impacted those who are directly affected are and how devastating the consequences of discrimination and uh, hate crimes are. Uh, they're motivated uh, by prejudice and this parliament must continue its work to stamp them out. However, in doing so, we must recognise the broader cultural harm and make sure that's not forgotten. Uh, we, we can't uh, allow uh, inaction um, and whilst I do recognise we're going to take forward these specific recommendations, we shouldn't forget uh, that there are other interventions at our disposal uh, that can be just as effective um, and are just as pressing. Uh, this substantial and detailed report is very much welcomed and we've heard that today. It provides that opportunity that several members have talked about uh, to progress the debate um, and look how we can go further. The 22 recommendations focus uh, our attention on a number of key areas and priorities. And it's important uh, that we've started that debate today to discuss the best way to take them forward. Uh, I, for one, am particularly keen to hear the views of wider stakeholders, as I think this is a conversation uh, that, if it's going to be successful, can't just be had here in the Parliament. Uh, nor are these decisions that the government should take in isolation. And in that spirit, I do welcome uh, the approach that's been taken and the chance uh, to have this debate today. Uh, as we've already heard, there are sincere and informed perspectives on a number of the recommendations, and there are clearly going to be areas where people have concerns and differing opinions. And I think Liam MacArthur makes important points about how we go about having those disagreements. Uh, for me, at the heart of many of these differences, is a difficulty in addressing the balance of how people feel and the harm caused and reflecting how the legal process works in practice. Absolutely everyone in this parliament is committed to addressing the problem, but the challenge is how we achieve that. Um, and there are two key areas I, I would like to highlight. The first one uh, concerns recommendation eight, uh, which I understand has drawn some concerns, including from Inclusion Scotland, who do not agree um, that there, should be, that there should no longer be an express requirement to state the extent to which a sentence being imposed is different uh, for, that with, for that which would have been imposed in the absence of an aggravation. This concerns me because I think it sends out the wrong message um, and I believe that it might actually make the sentencing process less transparent for the victim, the offender and wider society. I also believe that it might have unintended consequences when sentences are appealed and compared. And in my view, it's an area which requires uh, some more thought. While I understand uh, from reading the report there are legitimate concerns about the complexity of the sentencing process, um, I remain somewhat unconvinced that the task in question is too, complica too complicated for sentencers, uh, given what we ask of them and the other requirements placed upon them. Secondly, I wanted to put on the record how pleased I was to see restorative justice feature so significantly in the report, uh, with Lord Brackadale encouraging practitioners to learn from developing practice in this area. Uh, the, from taking part in the recent members' debate, there's wide support um, across the chamber uh, to, to develop restorative justice, and it has, I think, an important role to play in helping find the balance I spoke about earlier in my speech. I'm pleased uh, that we've had this opportunity today as a parliament 
uh, to look at some of the uh, recommendations in detail. Clearly, there could be much more debate uh, on what's a very substantive report. Uh, but, presiding officer, I, I look forward to seeing the details uh, when the government bring forward uh, their proposals in response to this report. And I'm sure uh, many of the points raised today uh, will be reflected upon uh, closely before then, uh, and there'll be a further chance to debate them. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by John Mason. I can allow you up to five minutes, Mr. Dornan. Presiding officer, when this report was released, I was preparing for a trip to Srebrenica. I was able to quickly digest some of it, but I look forward to going over the report meticulously to ensure that every recommendation is considered before we discuss it further. I'd be derelict in my duties, therefore, if I didn't start off by talking about my trip to Bosnia. Nothing could possibly make me more aware of the need to combat the insidious planting of hate at an early stage than seeing how Bosnia, particularly the area around Sarajevo, went from being a cosmopolitan, integrated, welcoming place to a place where long-term friends, apparently overnight, turned into your murderer, culminating in the genocide of Srebrenica and Prajador. They just couldn't conceive that something like this could happen in Bosnia. But of course, events like this don't happen overnight. There was a slow calculated process of dehumanizing people of a different faith or background, manufacturing grievances from a mythical past and blaming any and all present woes on your neighbor, work colleague or friend. During my trip, I had a look at remembering Srebrenica's six stages of genocide, along with others in the, the group. Scotland, well, certain parts of it at least, could be seen to be at stage three when it comes to the issue of sectarianism. Now, I'm not for a second saying that means we're heading for a similar situation. All I'm saying is we must always be vigilant. We had the great privilege, and I do consider it a privilege, to meet and listen to the stories of four heroes of Sarajevo and Srebrenica, our guide and host, Resad Trebonja, who at the age of 19 went from being a long-haired student to fighting in the front line, along with four other young men, with five AK-47s and 15 bullets between them on that first day, simply to defend his city. Hassan Hanovic, who lost his twin brother and his father on the march from Srebrenica to Tuzla, who now spends his life telling the story to others, who's been over to the Scottish Parliament, I believe he's certainly been over to Scotland. Bakira Hasecic, who was raped, her daughter was raped, her sister was raped, and he took over her house to use as a rape centre, where she eventually killed herself. Then finally, one of the mothers of Srebrenica, Fadila Effendik, she lost her husband, she lost her son. Her husband's remains were found, identified, and returned to her and buried. They then identified bones of her son, which she held on to for years, because she was waiting to see if they could find more of him. After a number of years, she buried everything she had of her son, which was two shin bones. To keep the memory of her son alive, she made 273 t-shirts, copied his signature on them, and then gave them to people. And why 273? Because that's the number of young men born in 1975, just like her son, who were found in mass graves in Srebrenica. And why am I speaking so long about Srebrenica? Because the description of it before the war sounded so much like Scot the Scotland we all know. We've got difficulties, political, personal, but generally we got on and we certainly don't hate because of our differences. It highlights more than any other example I can think of how easy it is to take your eye off the ball, to let things escalate until it's maybe too late to stop it. Presiding officer, in its report at stage one, the Justice Committee noted that the scrutiny of the repeal bill had sparked a new debate on sectarian behaviour, which I certainly intend to continue with. Members should be aware that I'm in the process of establishing the cross-party group and combating sectarianism in Scottish society. Their initial meeting is set to take place at 6 p.m. on the 27th of June. And I've had interest from Labour and Conservative MSPs, and therefore I hope to get the group formalised after summer recess. And this is particularly important because we must show the people of Scotland that when it comes to tackling hate crime, there is no party-wide division. Anyone who is willing to join, please get in touch with me by email. My intention is to build upon the Brackadale report. However, we will not be seeking to define sectarianism. We've already heard the, the working group mentioned. And of course, it's for the, work, it's for the cross party group to decide what, we, uh, what our work will be and not just mine. We ho I hope it will take a holistic approach speaking to religious groups, academics, charities, organisations, educators and other stakeholders to work, build on the recommendations in Lord Brackadale's report. I am delighted with the report, but having lived in the west of Scotland all my life, I feel saddened that we're still having to debate these issues. In 2016-17, a shocking total of 719 charges 
were reported to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service with either a religious aggravation under Section 74 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act uh, or, and, and Section 1 and 6 of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. So therefore, there's no way that we can rest on our laurels in the hope that sectarianism will go away on its own because the evidence shows that it's not going away and we cannot allow it to get worse. There is a religious divide which to this day vibrates through certain parts of Scottish society. While that exists, I will do anything within my elected power to combat it. I may look at a, to amend the report under the provisions around sectarianism in Lord Brackendale's report after reading it more closely, but my main message to the Chamber today is this. We must be careful with our use of language. We should never be complacent. And remember that if that can happen in 20th century Europe, it can happen anywhere. Thank you. Call John Mason as the last of the open debate contributions. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Mason. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And firstly, I do very much, as others have done, want to welcome this report. Hatred is not a good thing, although it is an attitude, and is that, as, as such, it is not easy to deal with by legislation. As Lord Brackadale quotes Martin Luther King, well, it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behaviour can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. Lord Brackadale makes clear that he received a range of responses, including some from individuals who opposed the very concept of hate crime. However, I believe we do need to deal with it as we see it happening in present day Scotland. Black and minority ethnic folk, gypsy travelers, Muslims, Jews, disabled people are all the object of hate at times. But freedom of speech is important too, Getting the balance right is not easy, and Lord Brackadale deals with that in his report. He makes the important point in chapter two that people are free to think what they like and to express their views, even if they might be offensive to many people. However, he then says at some point, regulation of conduct becomes necessary. There's a lot of good stuff in the report, but I'd like to focus my comments on chapter five, which is about stirring up offenses. Currently, we only have the offense of stirring up hatred in relation to race. The Offensive Behaviour at Football Act did attempt to widen that out, specifically to religion, but that has been repealed. So the question is whether we should have an offence of stirring up hatred, perhaps covering all the protected characteristics. This would mean that there did not need to be a baseline offence, for example assault or vandalism, with a statutory aggravation, but that the stirring up hatred in itself would be an offence. Lord Brackadale puts forward the arguments in favour which include stirring up hatred is considered morally wrong. It can lead to actual harm, for example, by creating a social atmosphere where prejudice and prejudices and discrimination are accepted as normal. It would only be an offence if it was serious enough, for example, the Punish a Muslim campaign or seeking to rid Europe of Jews. Interestingly, he puts the case for law having a symbolic function, even if the number of prosecutions was not great, compared to a baseline offence plus aggravation. He says that there is a gap in the law, especially where the hatred is aimed at a group rather than an individual. And depending on the circumstances and context, it could be more appropriate to proceed with a charge of stirring up hatred. Freedom of expression is clearly hugely important to most of us. For example, we want to be allowed to have a discussion and criticism of religion or religions. And I accept that some of the church and some of the other Christian input has emphasized the need to protect freedom of speech almost to the exclusion of all else. But I also accept the argument that freedom of speech is not absolute. And as the report suggests, it should be possible to frame legislation which distinguishes between rational argument and rabble rousing. He refers to Article 10 ECHR, which protects freedom of expression, but points out that the courts have decided that this protection does not include speech inciting violence against the general population. So it is not a completely unrestricted freedom. Lord Brackadale refers to both the EU and the UN making the point that religion and race can be linked in practice. Thus, hatred of Catholics and Irish can be connected, even though not all Irish are Catholics or all Catholics are Irish. Similarly, hatred of Israel and hatred of the Jews can be difficult to distinguish. He also compares Scotland to the rest of the UK, Canada and most of Australia and says that Scotland has the least provision for offences of stirring up hatred. He argues against having a hierarchy of protected characteristics and therefore all should have a stirring up offence. 
This point about a hierarchy came up as the 2010 Equality Act went through, and the UK government at that time refused to include either a statement that there was a hierarchy or that there was not. So Lord Bracadale concludes recommend, in recommendations 13 to 16 that we should introduce stirring up hatred offences, and this should be based on conduct which is threatening or abusive, and there should be an intention to stir up hatred or hatred is likely to be stirred up. I have to say I find his arguments in Chapter 5 very persuasive. I suspect there will be a lot more debate to happen on this topic, Presiding Officer, but my initial reaction to the work of Lord Bracadale and his team is very positive, and I wholeheartedly endorse it as a strong basis for moving forward. Thank you. We move to the closing speeches, and I call Patrick Harvey for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the chance to contribute to this debate, uh, and I thank those who've contributed to the report and produced it uh, for us to, to consider. Uh, I, I guess I've found myself considering this debate in the context of what has come before it, because this Parliament has debated these matters long and hard many, many times, pretty much since the beginning of devolution, when Donald Gorry made uh, a number of points about the need to address sectarianism. My colleague Robin Harper joined that with calls for a wider approach to hate crime, including uh, homophobic hate crime, back in session one. And following that, during session two of the Parliament, a working group on hate crime was established, uh, which reported early on in, in session two, and yet its key recommendations were not taken forward. Uh, I had the chance to bring forward a member's bill in session three to implement the key recommendations on aggravated offences in relation to sexual orientation, trans identity and disability. And there was strong consensus about taking those steps, but there was also a strong consensus at the time that the landscape of this legislation was becoming cluttered and that the next thing that should happen was consolidation. And then in session four, we had the OBFA. I don't think that we should rehearse the arguments on the OBFA again. I think where we need to get to is just living with the fact that we had a sincere disagreement across the parliament about that and now move on and take forward some of the positive ideas that are before us now. And I commend those like Anna Sawar and uh, Ivan McKee and Oliver Mundell, who I think have approached today's debate in that spirit. But it is now, a number of years later, that we're beginning to consider the, the option of a, a consolidation bill. Two themes that I'd like to draw out against that historic backdrop. Until the OBFA, incitement to hatred legislation had been proposed, considered, and never pursued by this parliament. Repeatedly, the parliament had taken the view uh, that notwithstanding the existing UK legislation uh, on racial hatred, uh, we should use aggravated offences as the core argument. And the, the, the Brackadale report recommends that that should continue to be the core central concept in our hate crime. Uh, and for me, aggravated offences are not just about getting tough on crime or having more severe sentences. It's about getting the right sentence for the right circumstances and getting a recognition in public of the, uh, the, 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 the context in which an offence has been committed and the, the impact that it has. But Brackadale also recommends new stirring up offences. And it seems to me that he's recommending something of a softer version of incitement to hatred, but applied more generally throughout society rather than in specific circumstances like football. Well, it might well be that we can find a way to make that work well. But I do think we need to be conscious of the fact that it would be a departure from what has worked well so far since devolution. Secondly, the, the, the additional theme uh, of um, standalone offences. And during sessions one, two, and three, there was a lack of consensus amongst women's organisations in Scotland uh, about forms of hate crime. And many of them wanted to remain focused on getting domestic violence legislation right. Now things have moved on, and there does seem to be more of a consensus amongst those organisations that a standalone of offence of misogynistic abuse should be considered. I think we need to listen seriously to those concerns, not just looking at whether existing offences have failed to capture certain uh, circumstances, but also new forms of offensive behaviour and abusive behaviour like online misogyny. 
Finally, presiding officer, these are not contradictions. A single piece of hate crime legislation can both consolidate our existing laws and address the need where it exists for new standalone offences. Uh, and I look forward to the debate that we'll have over the coming months about this matter. I call Roger Grant for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I too welcome Lord Brackadale's report. Hate crime is a blight on our society and it causes people to live in fear and feel dis disengaged from their communities. And Daniel Johnston pointed out that this not only applies to the person who's directly the victim of abuse, but it can also mean that people who share the same protected characteristics become fearful of attacks. And it might be my perception, but certainly anecdotally, this kind of abuse seems to be becoming more common. When times are hard, people need someone to blame, and those they blame will always be someone different from themselves. And whether that be gender, and ethnicity, sexuality, disability, or indeed any of the other excuses that people find to hate others and blame them for their own troubles. An enlightened society must not buy into this and we must challenge it where it happens both culturally and legally and therefore the Brackadale report is a starting point to enable us to do this and I think we can build on it. While the report has been widely welcomed, there are concerns that it misses out on misogyny and I believe this requires greater scrutiny. Lord Brackadale talks about a, a gender aggravation which I read carefully. What's clear is that any offences against men by women are not perpetrated on the basis that they are men. Therefore, recognition of misogyny and violence against women appears to me to be missing from this report. And Rona Mackay, John Finney and others um, talked about in gender's um, submission on that. And I think we need to have regard to that submission. I was alarmed when, it, when the report appeared to dismiss um, calls for this because women had accepted this behaviour in the past. They didn't. It was only, it's only now that women have become more empowered and these calls have grown louder and this abuse is now in the spotlight. Misogynistic behaviour is wrong, was wrong then, it's wrong now. That said, we need to look at what is being proposed and how it will protect women. Daniel Johnston talked about extending the stirring up hatred um, to a, a definition to all protected characteristics. And we especially need to closely examine whether a new crime of stirring up hatred would cover misogyny or whether we require to be more specific. Many aspects of violence against women are already crimes, but still hatred of women due to their gender is all too common. And we've seen the growth of people who call themselves incels or involuntary celibates who preach hatred against women and those who have relationships with them. Anna Sarwar talked about the rise of Islamophobia and it is deeply worrying. The extreme form of this is that it's used as an excuse because of terrorism carried out in the name of Islam. However, we didn't blame Christianity, Catholic or Protestant for the terrorism that came out of Ireland. Islamophobia is therefore rooted in racism and hatred and must be stamped out. And there's sexism involved in this too, because Islamophobia often manifests itself in the criticism of women who choose to wear a burqa or a hijab. And this week in Denmark, Denmark became the latest European country to ban women with face coverings. And it's surely for women to decide what they wear, whether it's a burqa or a miniskirt. It's a matter for her, and her choice should not be commented on or used to make assumptions about her. We have no parallel in men's clothing, although there is male religious attire. It's always women who have what they wear or not wear dictated to by men. Can I turn now to the, um, the recommendation 19, um, talking about no statutory replacement for section one of the offensive behavior at football and threatening commun communication Scotland Act. This recommendation vindicates James Kelly's position and a number of speakers talked about that, Liam Kerr and Liam MacArthur. The tone of that debate um, was, was hostile and indeed some of the abuse directed to James Kelly was not enlightening. And it's sad that some of this was repeated today in this debate. I, I believe when James Kelly says that... Very briefly. 
James Dornan. C can uh, the member tell us what abuse was uh, given to Mr Kelly today? And would Mr Kelly, would you, would, would you like to balance the abuse Through that the Mr Kelly please. got to the abuse that I received during that offensive behaviour? Rhoda Grant. I, I think it's the tone of the whole debate, that debate and this debate. In fact, this debate was a really good debate until we touched on this recommendation where there was a degree of hostility that it was, was not edifying. And I would suggest that we listen to what Patrick Harvey was saying about let it go and move on. And in that tone, I would ask the Minister to look at the working group because there were concerns expressed about its membership. Now, if, you don't, if people don't have a confidence in the membership of that working group, then they won't have confidence in what, what it, it comes out with. So therefore, in the spirit of this debate, I would ask her to take that away and perhaps look at that again. There was also recommendations about the exploitation of vulnerable people, and I think that would be a worthwhile um, inclusion into our, our legislation. Um, Inclusion Scotland have welcomed this, but also we've always heard about stories of older people being subject to theft and fraud and indeed disabled people. And I think this would go a long way um, to treat this, to, to deal with this and make it as uh, unacceptable in the courts as it is in society. And Inclusion Scotland also told us that there is an increase in um, crime against uh, disabled people, sometimes double or three times um, what is experienced by able-bodied people. Uh, presiding officer, just to close, I hope the report provides a foundation for legislation that tackles hate crime, and I think we need to build on it to create the inclusive society we all wish. Call Gordon Lindhurst, up to seven minutes, please. Deputy presiding officer, in opening my speech in closing for the Scottish Conservatives, may I remind members of the entry in my register of interest as a practising advocate. Lord Brackadale's review into hate crime legislation was much anticipated and has generated a number of ideas and recommendations which have been uh, debated here across the chamber this afternoon. And as has been mentioned, while hate crime overall has dropped in the last year, the issue still arose in over 5,000 charges in Scotland. And while some protected characteristics featured less, unfortunately others featured more. Now those are statistics but the issue arises in many unreported instances as well. So how the legislation works goes right to the heart of this review. And whatever the views on the desirability of having particular focuses in criminal law, rather than a single focus on the overarching principle that all should be treated fairly and equally under the law, recommendation 20, to consolidate the various pieces of legislation into one single statute, seems entirely sensible. Doing this will also allow a review of where we are at and to make appropriate amendments to the law, for an ironing out of the provisions is overdue. And if the government pursues this approach through Parliament, it could also help to raise awareness amongst the public, raising awareness that is sadly still needed when we consider cases such as the anti-Semitism one cited by Lord Brackadale and mentioned by my colleague Liam Kerr during this debate. Before moving on, I would like to touch on one recommendation, that is recommendation two, and the report briefly comments at paragraph 310 on the use of language in statute. He, Lord Brackadale recommends use of the English phrase of demonstrating hostility rather than the Scottish phrase evincing malice and ill will. In doing so, he does state that he does not suggest there should be any change in the meaning or legal definition of the thresholds. However, I doubt that anyone who finds themselves in the unpleasant circumstances of being the victim of a crime, and particularly an aggravated crime, immediately reaches for the statute book to see whether or not and how to report what has happened to them. A lawyer might, but lawyers form a very small percentage of the population. Rather, in reporting to the police what has hap happened, a victim rightly relies in the first place on the police to identify the nature of the crime perpetrated. Changing the legal definition would seem unlikely to address the perceived confusion that Lord Brackadale identifies or make it more likely that people will report or challenge their experience. I note that he refers to the confusion in respect of the concept of hate crimes, but in his section about aggravations. So it may be, as judges often point out to counsel during submissions, that 
it is not his best point in what is an otherwise thorough and carefully written report. And it is surely of the nature of the issues involved in this area of the criminal law that make it difficult for anyone to pin it down as lawyers try to do. And a change of language is un unlikely, in my view, to help on that point. My concern is simply use of the word hostility in the legislation would water down the standard required as that word is commonly understood in Scotland. What, after all, is hostility? It is an extremely subjective word and not one that is likely to provide clarity. Just something to think about as we move forward to avoid uncertainty in legislation. For as Lord Barkerdale himself accepts, legislation on its own is unlikely to be the whole answer. And sadly, when law is created in the wrong way, it can have the opposite effect and turn people against not only those who make the law, but those who implement it, and indeed even those it is meant to protect, a point well made by Annie Wells. As Maurice Corey pointed to today, the badly formulated law, the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, has had its final nail in the coffin. Recommendation 19 of the review directly contradicts what the First Minister and her colleagues have been saying about a void in the law left by the repeal. Lord Brackadale clearly concludes that no such void has opened up. And he also says that the same approach, in, in a moment, in a moment, he also says that the same approach that we were able to use in football without the Act can be adopted in relation to sectarian behaviour outside of football. I'll take the intervention. George Adam. Yes, uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the member for taking the intervention. It's quite interesting listening to the member because in Lord Brackendale's report on page 5, it says, I invited representatives from each of the opposition parties in the Scottish Parliament to meet me and discuss the work of the review. As a result, I met with the Justice Spokesman from the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, and the convener of the Scottish Green Party. But there was no representation from the Tories. Why is that? Why are the Tories not engaging with this very important review? Gordon Linters. Um, the Conservatives have engaged uh, actively in this matter, and Lord Brackadale, as an excellent lawyer, managed to come to the correct conclusions without uh, comprehensive engagement. <laughs> And uh, to, to, deal, to deal with the point, to deal with the point that has been raised, and that's about the section six section, of course, one ne merely needs to read his whole report because at paragraph 619, he makes perfectly clear that the Communications Act 2003, and I quote him, can be and is used in relation to a wide range of online content. In other words, you don't need an act with football in the title directed at football supporters, you can use the other act that applies to everyone to deal with the issues raised. Um, and indeed, if you, one looks at paragraph 6.23, again in his report, he points to the sections 38 and 39 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. So in fact, he deals with uh, all of these points and deals with them very well. Now, having concluded that, the act that is the official behavior, the offensive behavior at Football Act will not be missed. Uh, there are many other aspects of Lord Brackadale's review that we've touched on. Liam Kerr emphasized the importance of protection for the vulnerable, and I would echo what he said about that. Oliver Mundell raised some very important points about sentencing and restorative justice. And I would like to simply conclude by referring to John Mason's point and that is about the issue of whether or not there should be an offence of stirring up hate crime. Now, I have to urge caution on that because, of course, freedom of expression is a very, very important right in a democracy. And that any possible or suggested uh, provision would have to be looked at extremely carefully to ensure that it doesn't send out the wrong message, as John Mason suggests law should be used for. I call Annabel Ewing to uh, wind up the debate. Um, around seven minutes will take us to decision time, Minister. Hi, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to welcome the many positive contributions to the debate today. And I think there is a very clear recognition that hate crime must be tackled effectively if we are to become the Scotland that we all want to see. We cannot build an open and inclusive society if we allow bigots and bullies to peddle hatred and set community against community. And as I said in my opening statement, whilst legislation is not the only element to tackling hate crime, 
it is an important aspect of this agenda. And importantly, it is an element that this chamber actually can uh, deliver. So by working together, we can ensure that Scotland's ability to tackle hate crime is the best uh, that we can make it. Um, we have accepted the principle, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, Lord Brackadale set out, that we should be working towards the delivery of a consolidated hate crime statute. But the, the detail of what will be included in the final hate crime bill will only be uh, decided once we've had an opportunity, as I said earlier, to engage widely and to engage with relevant stakeholders and have the conversations and obviously proceed with a consultation. Um, in terms of the uh, issues raised by a number of members on the important issue of misogyny uh, and the concerns that have been raised subsequent to Lord Brackadale's uh, re review being published by, in particular, Engender, Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, I do uh, recognise the very significant concerns that these organisations have and I would be very willing indeed to ensure that we have a very meaningful and detailed engagement with these organisations to hear at first hand what their specific concerns are and to see how we feel is the best way to move uh, forward in terms of any proposals we make. Lord Brackadale's report presents us with a, a number of recommendations that will indeed, as has been said, provide a strong basis for consulting on the content of a consolidated hate crime uh, bill. And I do hope that this process will be positive and will be constructive and that all of us will engage in it recognising that we need to provide robust protection for all vulnerable individuals and communities in Scotland. And of course, uh, notwithstanding what we have said today, and we are not complacent, none of us across this chamber, Scotland, uh, it has to be said at the same time, is a multi-faith and multicultural society, and that is a strength and not a weakness. Uh, and we want to be ready to welcome new uh, communities uh, who seek to make and um, individuals who seek to make Scotland their home a place where they will feel safe where they will feel secure and where they will feel welcomed and that is why we have never tried to, to downplay the impact of hate crime or claim that the problem simply doesn't exist in Scotland that would be patently uh, not uh, true but we do recognize that we have something certainly to build on uh, presiding officer uh, we all have the potential to become a victim of hate crime at different times in our lives and therefore we all have a role to play in tackling hate crime. Everything from simple acts of kindness to those who are different from ourselves to ensuring that those who indulge in criminal acts of hatred are prosecuted and held accountable for their actions. This uh, activity all make, it makes it all clear that we will not allow our society to be undermined by those who thrive in hatred. And I would just wish to uh, clarify a particular matter with regard to the definition group on sectarianism, because I do think it's very important to clarify that the membership actually was based on individuals who have a track record of involvement in tackling uh, sectarianism or perhaps legal expertise. And they're not there in a representative capacity vis-a-vis -vis any organisation, be it a church or any other body. And when they have reached their conclusions, there will, of course, be full engagement, uh, which will take place with all interested bodies, including churches. And I would, I've got very limited time, uh, Mr Kelly, and I would like to move on. We cannot afford to be complacent. And taking forward work to build uh, an approach to hate crime with consolidated legislation at its heart is a clear signal that we have adopted a zero-tolerance approach to hate crime. For one incident of, of hatred is one too many, as has been uh, mentioned by many members this afternoon. And to achieve this, we need to encourage more people to report hate crime in the first place. Another very important point that has been raised uh, by many uh, members. In terms of reporting, uh, we, we know that uh, many uh, witnesses or victims do not feel comfortable in coming forward to the police and, and rather feel comfortable uh, reporting uh, the incident to someone they are familiar with. And that is why Police Scotland works in partnership with a wide variety of partners ranging from housing associations, to victim support offices and voluntary groups to allow reports to come to them through a third party reporting centre. Staff in these centres are spe especially trained to provide support and assistance in submitting a report to Police Scotland on behalf of the victims and witnesses. Police Scotland has recently reviewed the effectiveness of third party reporting centres and is implementing an improvement plan which includes measuring effectiveness. Going forward, uh, we will be looking at the need for additional development to ensure that third-party reporting centres are responding well to the improvements proposed to the legislation. I would just pick up here on, uh, 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 picking up on, on James Dornan's uh, uh, account of his uh, delegation's visit this week to Srebrenica and picking up a point, an important point that Anna Sauer made, which was that we shouldn't just have the law in place. We have to have this as a, a, a living reality for every citizen of our country. Uh, and I would like to quote, and, and uh, John Finney alluded to this, um, DCC Ian, Ian Livingston, the acting chief constable, who said on his return, and I quote, 
he was on that delegation this week, the lessons I have taken from Srebrenica must be reflected in Police Scotland's ongoing approach to upholding human rights and combating hatred. I think that's a very important statement uh, indeed. Presiding officer, I see that I have uh, not very much time left, less than I thought I might, uh, but obviously uh, in terms of hate crime stats, we are conscious that while some have decreased, others have increased in terms of the recent uh, statistics. Uh, we also uh, would wish to, uh, I would wish to flag up that data held by Police Scotland will add indeed another piece to the jigsaw of our understanding of hate crime and that's why we're working with Police Scotland to produce a new publication on police recorded incidents with a hate element and that will be produced later uh, this year. In conclusion, presiding officer, I, I would wish to make one point as strongly and as clearly as possible. The Scottish Government is fully committed to tackling all forms of hate crime wherever and whenever they occur and we believe that having robust hate crime legislation that is fit for 21st century Scotland is absolutely central to this. We want all of our diverse communities to enjoy equality in a meaningful uh, sense. For hateful behaviour is insidious, it is corrosive and it diminishes each of us. It has no place in modern Scotland and it is time for us all to be vigilant and for us all to stand united against hatred. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Lord Brackadale's independent review of hate crime legislation. And as it happens, there are no questions to be put as a result of today's business. So I would thank members for their contributions and their attendance. I close this meeting. <laughs>